Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Not many people, I suppose, remember the name of the writer Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Yet among fans of the Gothic tale, he is considered by many as the equal of the great masters such as Poe, Stevenson, and de Maupassant. Judge for yourself as you listen to perhaps his greatest short story, grisly, ghoulish, and inaccessibly haunting... Don't leave her alone in the dark. The door. I can't touch it. We will break it down. No! 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 She's not in the bed. Hold the lamp higher. She's not in the room. The window. Could she have fallen or jumped? The shutters are closed. The, the latch still thrown. There. Can you see anything, Shulkin? No, Herr Bookman. The street is empty. The canal is smooth as glass. She's gone. Rose is gone. As if she'd never returned. Our mystery drama, Till Death Do Us Join, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Don Scardino and Roberta Maxwell. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Of all the painting he must have done in his solitary lifetime, there exists today, in remarkable condition, only one canvas of Godfrey Shalkins, pupil of Gerard Bookman, who in turn was a pupil of the great Rembrandt. The picture represents a chamber in some antique religious building. Its foreground is occupied by a young woman of startling beauty, her face illuminated by a strange smile, half lovely, half evil. In the background is the shadowy form of a man dressed in the old Flemish fashion, propped up in a coffin, as though in a bed. A fascinating picture, and a chilling one. No one who views it can repress a shudder. Why? On the back of the canvas is a legend, written in cramped longhand by the painter, which may serve to explain why. Think me boorish, rude, and laugh at my slovenly ways and filthy habits. But they buy my pictures, for I am an artist beyond peer. My whole life I have devoted to trying to forget what I once was. The only life I have had is canvas and pigments and a search for escape in the only fashion I can accomplish it. Once I was young as other men, with a bright future in my chosen profession, full of laughter and joy and madly in love. Oh, there were barriers to overcome, impossible heights to scale, but with the hope and optimism of youth, I knew I could win out. How could I know that a force beyond any human strength would strangle my spirit, twist and deform my soul? and doom me to a lifetime of despair. Rose! 
We are alone, beloved. All the other students are gone. And Herr Buchmann? He left the studio for home less than five minutes ago. I know. I only wanted to be sure I had made no mistake. How do you know? I had Jacob, the groom, drive me into Amsterdam today to shop for some silks. On the way back, I had him stop at his favorite beer stub to have a beer and groom the horses whilst I took a stroll along the canal. I was hoping to catch you alone at the studio, and my prayers were answered when I saw my uncle climb into his carriage and drive off. My dearest one, if only I could declare my love for you openly. Oh, you will be famous very soon, and we are still young. We have time. Every moment spent away from you is an eternity. It is just as bad for me. But for the moment, we must live with it. Come, let me see what you have been working on, my genius. No, no, it is in no shape. I, I cannot make it come right. And it is still only a sketch. But, Godfrey, you are wrong. The conception is beautiful. And even the freehand outline tells all the world you are a master. Or to become one. Tells all the world. Well, perhaps you're right. For you are all my world. If whatever I do satisfies you, it would be reward enough. Oh, no. We must do better than that so that we can have each other. Finish this one as you have started, and I will see that Uncle Gerard gets the canvas to the right places. Once someone buys you, you will become a vogue. I know it. I feel it in my... In my bones. Not in your heart? In my heart, what I feel is my love for a man named Godfrey Shalkin. Will I ever be rich enough to make you my wife? Hold me, Godfrey. Hold me very tight. Rose. Rose. I want to believe. Help me to. In every way I can. Oh. But what happened? I don't know. A sudden chill as if... The time. I must go. I would do nothing to set Menea Bookman against us. Why can't I just go to him? No, he... no, I beg you. I know my uncle. He would only send you away and then you would have lost everything. Me, his teaching, your future. Hush, my darling. Trust in God. And let us hope. I love you. I shall always love you. God give you grace. What grace has a God who keeps two lovers apart? Heaven, forgive me. I meant it not. But the words had been said and could not be taken back. I turned to my sketch, one of the temptations of St. Anthony by the devil. I set to work and was so busily engaged that an hour or so must have passed. The light was gone. As I sat back, I heard a sort of sniff behind me. A few feet behind me stood the figure of an elderly man in a cloak and a broad-brimmed conical hat. The room was so dark by now that the shadow from his hat obscured his features entirely. But I was impressed, awed at the perfect stone-like stillness of the figure. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you come in. This is the studio of Gerard Bookman. It is. Will you sit, my dear? No. I wish to talk to him. He has returned to his home some hours past. If you would wish to seek him there... No. Will you see him before tomorrow evening? Oh, yes, sir. I am one of his pupils, and he will be here by late morning to commence his classes. Are you to be trusted with a message? I hope so. Fail to deliver it at your peril... Tell Gerard Bookman that Menair van der Housen of Rotterdam wishes to speak to him here tomorrow evening at exactly seven in this room on matters of weight. He turned abruptly and with a quick but utterly silent step quit the room. Some strange premonition drew me to the window through which I could see the exit door to the street bordering the canal. I waited in vain for him to appear. The darkness was now gathering in earnest. Leaving the studio and locking the door, I half expected to find him lurking in the halls below. But he had vanished as mysteriously and completely as he had first appeared. 
Nor was the mysterious stranger further identified when I reported him to Mynheer Bookman the following noon. Vanderhausen? Vanderhausen. <clears throat> no, the <clears throat> name means nothing to me. From Rotterdam, you say? He said. Yes. Well, we shall wait for the appointed hour, and in the meanwhile, to work. I have looked at your sketches on the temptation of St. Anthony. The line, the chiaroscuro, the coloration are acceptable, well done and conceived. But the expressions, it's as if St. Anthony were the devil and the devil the saint. What is your conception? Why? Your Honor, I, I, I cannot answer... I do not know. Well, uh, the other pupils are arriving. Now, let's see if your conception can improve during class studies. So, my poor Shalkin. The others are all gone, and I had little time for you today. Ah, I want the canvas. I don't know, Master. I found it hard to concentrate. <laughs> so did I. Let's forget pigment and brushes a while and join me in a glass of brandy. It's been a long, hard day, and I have some strange premonition. This visitor you tell me to expect bears some ill tidings. Well, at all events, let's fortify ourselves against ill chance. Your health. Your health. At seven, you said. He said... Bonderhausen. <laughs> Never heard of the man. What can he want of me? A portrait? A poor relation to be apprenticed? A collection to be evaluated? Well, you should soon learn. The Stadthouse is sounding the hour. I should leave. No. Stay with me, Godfrey. You're young and strong... And for some reason, I have a foreboding about this mysterious appointment. No, the clock has ceased. I shall not wait too long for... He, he seems to be here, sir. I'll go, let him in. By your leave, young sir. You are Gerard Bookman? I am. I have the honor to address Mynheer Vanderhausen of Rotterdam. The same. I understand your worship wished to meet with me, and I'm here, as you see, by your appointment. It is well. Is that a man of trust? Well, he's my prized pupil, of course. Yes. Well, then let him take this box of leather and get the nearest jeweler or goldsmith to value its contents. Why? That I will explain to you alone. But I wish him to return with a certificate of the value of the contents. That is a strange request, Mynheer. May I ask the reason? When we are alone. And I think Jan Spurton in the next street will still be open. Godfrey, will you gratify the gentleman's wish? Your wish, sir. I will take as little time as I can. I had in my hands a small leather case, about nine inches square, surprisingly heavy for its size. I was less curious about its contents than the conversation I was about to miss. If I could even have dreamed of its subject and the consequences, but how could I? Instead of clairvoyance, I reacted normally to my master's orders and sought the information I had been asked to get. Godfrey Schalken, pupil of Master Gerard Bookman. Were it not for your master's good offices and the designs he presents me with, neither God nor the devil would persuade me to open up at this late hour. Well, what is it, young sir? My master bid me bring the contents of this leather case to you for evaluation. <laughs> that scuffed and crumbling jewel box? What nonsense. Still, by its antiquity, it's curious and challenging. Come in, come in, by all means. The wind makes enemies of my old bones. Now, what is the urgency that prompts this haste? 
I know not, Mynheer Spyton. Well, then, let me see. Give me the case. Good Lord. What is it? A moment. My loop and my scale so I can examine and weigh. Gold ingots. If they say it true, this is a king's ransom, young man. <laughs> If Godfrey Shalkin had only known, or guessed, he might have been tempted to seize the fortune in gold ingots and bury it in Amsterdam's deepest canal. For the contents of that scuffed, scraped case, soiled with age, were to turn his life about and transform him from a young, carefree man to the bitter, hating wretch who painted with the flair of the gods. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. While Godfrey Shalkin was learning from the goldsmith the incredible value of the contents of the leather case, a conversation was taking place between the mysterious stranger and his master. A conversation concerned with the girl he loved, Rose Welderkraust. Bookman's niece. A conversation that established those golden ingots not as a king's ransom, but a queen's. Herr Bookman, I will be free with you. I cannot, by limitations I dare not discuss, tarry with you long. Well, surely I can offer you a drink? No. Oh, some refreshment, food? No. Well, at least let me raise the lights. No. I'll divest you of your outer garment. No. But I can feed the fire more logs to warm you. I have no need of your offers, nor desire of them. I come to make you an offer. And will you come to the fire and sit? I prefer to stand where I am. The shadows suit me well. I don't understand. Some time ago, I saw you in the church of St. Lawrence in Rotterdam. With you was a young girl of exceptional beauty whom I later ascertained was your niece. I desire to marry her. Without meeting her? Conversing with her just from one glimpse? That was enough to convince me she was the woman I desire to share my future with. But, Rose... If I can satisfy you that I am wealthier than any husband you could ever dream for her, I expect that you, Herr Buckman, will forward my suit with your authority. And I must add that if you are to approve my proposal, it must be here and now, for I can brook no delays. You're extremely arbitrary, Minea. I am constrained to be. I offer no apology. I did not ask for one. You might reasonably have. My circumstances are such that I have none to offer. Well, you must be aware that my niece has a will of her own and may not acquiesce in what we may design for her advantage. The young man I sent out with a packet will return shortly. That will prove the evidence of my wealth and uh, security for your niece's life. I promise you it will be ten times the fortune she could expect. All of it in the interest that accrues shall be hers as long as she lives. Can I be more liberal? Well, if what you tell me is true, of course not. As to my... Respectability. You must take that for granted, at least for the present. I buy my name and reputation with what you're about to discover about me. My wealth. You, you must give me a moment to think. I remind you again, my time is limited. I will not pledge myself unnecessarily. But you will if it is necessary, and I consider it so. Testy old gentleman determined to have his own way. Eh? Why, those were the very words that you were thinking, I know. You also thought to yourself, all things considered, I'm not justified in declining the offer if the gold involved is satisfactory. Am I correct? You read my mind correctly. Please forgive the intrusion. 
and my abruptness. But we are both men of sense as well as sensibility. Your niece is penniless. I shall make her as rich or richer than a queen. When your young man returns with a valuation, if you don't wish the proposal withdrawn, you must immediately sign this engagement. Enter. Master, I've brought Mynheer Spyton's valuation of the contents of the case. Give them to Mynheer Vanderhausen. Oh, no. Oh, no, no. Give them to Mynheer Bookman. Yes, sir. Here they are, Master. <gasps> Gold ingots? The value? I, I can't believe it. Neither could Jan Spyton or myself. I fled back through the streets, searching every shadow. I have never seen so much wealth. Ten thousand guilders. A token only. My wealth is limitless. Will you sign the contract now? Uh, a moment. My eyes are, are tired and the light is dim. This youth must witness the contract. Let him read it to you. Will you, Godfrey? Yes, Master. This document represents an irrevocable agreement by Gerard Bookman as guardian at law to give Wilkin Vanderhausen the hand of his niece, Rose Velderkaust. Uh, go on, boy, go on. Of his niece, Rose Velderkaust, in marriage within one week of the date of this document. In exchange for this covenant, the said Wilkin Vanderhausen agrees to provide as a marriage settlement a package of gold ingots... I value... don't think it's necessary to read the rest. It's only the jargon of advocates. Mania Buckman... I have not tried in any way to stint in my offer. Now, are you, for your niece's sake as well as for your own, content? Well, I would dearly like perhaps uh, another day to consider. Not one hour. Very well. I am content. I can scarcely deny my niece her good fortune. Eh, hey, Godfrey? How, how can I presume to offer an opinion? Except that Rose, I mean, your Frau Velderkaus, should she not be consulted? A young girl is not the best judge of her future. Rose is my responsibility. Lovely as she is, when could she have such a chance again? Mynheer van der Huysen, I'm content. It is a bargain. Mm -hmm. And sign at once, I implore you, for I am weary. Very well. And now, the witness. I can't. I won't. What's this, Godfrey? I've taken you into my studio, supported you, taught you, reared you. How can you refuse me one simple request in return? I can't. Well, surely, Rose... There is only said... one answer, Mania Buckman. That young man is as taken with your niece as I am. Very well. Now, would you choose between us? Must we find another witness, or do I take my document and vanish from your life? Godfrey, how can you think of Rose? You, a, a painter, an artist. You have your own dedication in a field which may leave you penniless for the rest of your life. If you do truly love Rose, how can you deny her this opportunity? I love her more than life itself. I want only her happiness. Then sign. Master, I... There is Rose herself. Rose is not yet ready to know her own mind. I am her guardian. It's my duty to secure her future. If you love my niece, you'll realize it's in her own best interests. Because I love her, then, I sign. Mm. It is well. I will take the contract, and you keep the gold. I shall visit you at your house tomorrow night at nine o'clock, my good Mynheer Bookman, to meet formally with the object of the contract. <laughs> Again, stiffly, but with the same rapid movement, the shadowed figure was gone so swiftly I had no time to open the door for him. Again, the same unnamed fear drove me to the window to watch for his exit down below. 
And again, his movement must have been so rapid that I failed to see him leave and enter the street. Godfrey? Yes, Master. I'm sorry. I didn't know that you'd formed an attachment to my niece. I have no right to. And I'm glad you're sensible of that. A painter, hmm. it's an uneasy life of sacrifice and most of the time, poverty. So I shall hold my peace till the appointment a week from now. And uh, you will join us at dinner. Must I? It will be better for all of us to face and accept the future. It's striking nine, Rose. Is all arranged? As you see, Uncle. You're a perfect hostess. The fire shines like burnished gold and the table is set immaculately. Godfrey, a glass of wine? No, thank you, Master Bookman. You seem nervous. I am. I hope you're not going to lose control of your feelings. It isn't that, Master. Then what? I can't quite explain it. A strange foreboding. Hmm. You feel it too. Does Rose know what the occasion is? No. Then it is not too late. I have signed the contract. My word alone is its bond. But the paper is the final arbiter. Then there is no escape. Escape from what? A marriage settlement beyond my wildest dreams for my brother's daughter? I commend you to control your foolish dreams. I have done what must be done. And our guest is here. Rose? Yes, Uncle? Come stand by me to greet our visitor. Yes, Uncle. This time the room was brightly lighted. This time the mynheer had to shed his outer garments. This time we could see his features for the first time. His undersuit was a rich sable garment, his stockings of dark purple, his feet enclosed in shoes adorned with roses of the same color. His hands were enclosed in gauntlets, his hair long enough to rest on a plaited ruff. So far, all was well. But the face was a bluish, leaden hue, such as metallic medicines sometimes produce. The eyes muddy white and startlingly prominent with the glaze of insanity. And the lips a deep purple, almost black, twisted in a sensual, malignant, almost satanic fashion, such as my unwilling fingers had wanted to trace on the face of my Saint Anthony. The effect was so startling that for a long moment no one could speak. It was as though some devilish humor had dressed a corpse from the grave and invigorated it far enough to walk and talk and enter a room with the living. One must admit, of course, that Shulkin could scarcely see his rival, or to be more truthful, the man who had stolen his beloved from him, in the best light. The painter's eye tends to exaggerate, or at least translate the human figure into his own design. And jealousy is a poor measure for judgment. When we return shortly with Act Three, we will be able to make our own assessment of this strange and devious story. Stranger spoke little during the half hour or so he stayed. Nor could his host manage many more words. Such, indeed, was the nervous terror that Vanderhausen inspired that it was an effort not to fly in panic from the room. Something indescribably odd was about him. His movements, as if directed by a spirit unused to managing the machinery of the body. And two things were remarked by all. The fact that his eyelids never closed and that his chest was motionless, unstirred by the process of respiration. It was with a feeling of infinite relief for all when the door finally closed behind him. Oh, thank God. Are you all right, Rose? No. I feel as chilled as someone with fever. Oh, sh 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 my dear, don't exaggerate. I don't. 
He's a frightful man. I wouldn't see him ever again for all the wealth in the world. Don't be a foolish girl. A man may be as ugly as the devil, but if his heart is good and his actions match it, he's worth more than some handsome puppy with neither brains nor prospects. I don't want to talk about him anymore. But we must. The man is wealthy, liberal, and withal good-hearted. He has sued for you as his bride. His bride? It is my duty to see you well bestowed. I promised your father on his deathbed that I would make sure of that. Uncle, not that man. Enough for tonight. There are no decisions to make beyond the fact that it is time to retire. Godfrey, I shall see you in the morning. Yes, Master. Good night, Jufrau Veldekast. No need to be so formal. Rose. And good night, Godfrey. Don't look so troubled. Nothing has changed. My walk home will be lighted by that knowledge. Good night, Master Bookman. Good night, my boy. And remember, you're an apprentice painter. That is your first and most important loyalty. I am acutely aware of where I stand, Herr Bookman. Good night. Why were you so severe with him, Uncle? Because we live in a world of reality. What do you mean? Do you realize that Minia Vanderhausen, who visited us tonight, has guaranteed you 10,000 guilders of your own as an earnest of his love and admiration for you? I have them here. 10,000 guilders? It's his way of saying how much he loves you. Love, for all its charms, is not the most important thing in the world. You will marry Minia Vanderhausen according to the contract. The mood of hope that my beloved had kindled in me barely lasted till my return home to the bare and cheerless garret I lived in. Even if in my sleepless bed toss night I might have held to some grain of hope, the next day would have dispelled them forever had I been at the Bookman house. Another tradesman's wagon? What can it be now? I can't wait to see. Oh, Uncle, did you ever see such riches? Never. Look at this scarlet domino. How could he know it would be just the right length? Feel the richness of the velvet. And trimmed in white ermine, even to the hood. Oh, I'd love to paint you in that. The hood framing your face. <laughs> You're all beauty. What woman would not be in such a cloak? If only Manea Vanderhaus. Hush, Tash. Leave his appearance alone. You'll soon accustom yourself to it. Slippers in every color. A casket of jewels fit for an empress. This white, pure silk for my wedding gown. And the lace for my veil and train. Oh, Uncle, was any man ever so generous? Only the beginning, Rose. Whatever doubts I might have had, I think I've chosen your future well. And I too, dear Uncle. I will put Godfrey from my mind. In fact, he is already fading. Look at this necklace. This emerald pin. Oh, thanks to you, dear uncle. I may be the luckiest girl in the world. And so, one week later, I had to swallow my pride and watch my repulsive rival carry off my beloved Rose in solemn pomp in a carriage and four out of my life to Rotterdam. But I was mistaken. Rose Velderkost, now Rose Vanderhausen, was not out of my life yet. And I brought you home, my boy, to sup with me because I'm worried. And I've no one else to turn to. You may always count on me, Master. In all things, I know. In particular, this one. Contrary to all promises freely exchanged... It's four months since I've heard of my niece. Not one word. I'm too old to travel. Will you then be my emissary and take this letter to the boom key to inquire after my niece? If you desire me to. I do. You shall stay the night and take the coats for Rotterdam on the morning. I will issue you such funds as you need and... I pray you return post-haste 
with what word of comfort you can bring me. I will waste no time. I promise you. I left not a house in the boom key untried, Master, but no one had ever heard of my near Vanderhausen. Well, then where is my niece? I cannot tell. One thing I did when I returned to Amsterdam... I went to the establishment from which the coach and four was hired to take Rose and her bridegroom to Rotterdam. It's clever of you. And Jess? The driver reported that late in the evening, before they entered the city, a small party of men, dressed in the old fashion with peaked beards and pointed mustaches, standing in the center of the road, stopped the coach. Highway robbers? Apparently not. My near Vanderhausen seemed to have expected them, and he handed Rose down from the carriage and into an ornate, hand-carved but ancient litter, which the men lifted and bore off into the night. The driver making no attempt to stop them? No, since there was threat of force. All was as if it had been arranged, except... Except what? Except that Rose was weeping bitterly. Oh, dear Lord... What have I done? What can I do to reach her or help her? Jacob has already retired. See who that is, boy. At once, master. Rose. Oh. Dearest Rose. What is it? Wine. Wine, quickly, or I am lost. Master, she is distraught. Oh, Rose, my dearest, here. Here, drink. Oh, no food. Please, God, at once, or I perish. I'll cut some meat. Give it all to me. Send for a priest with all haste. Or in spite of all, I am not safe until he comes. Send for him speedily or I am lost forever. The dead and the living can never be one. God has forbid it. Up the stairs, quickly, Father. She is in terrible straits. Help me! Forgive me! Ah! No! No! He's here! Godfrey, draw your sword! Protect me! Where, right? Where? In the anteroom with you and the priest. Stand aside, Father. Hold the lamp high. Let me see in the shadow. Go down, I beg you. Do not leave my bedside. Only to bring you the priest. Don't be afraid, Father. Thou, sir, myself, and Godfrey are only a few steps from your bed. Oh, God, help me. Whom I have no right to ask. Oh, the candle is out. It is too late. He has come for me. Don't leave her alone in there. The door. I can't budge it. We will break it down. No! 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 She's not in the bed. Hold the lamp higher. She's not in the room. The window. Could she have jumped or fallen? They're shut fast. The latch is still thrown. There. Can you see anything? The street is empty. The canal is smooth as glass. She's gone. Rose is gone. As if she'd never returned. The days that followed are shady and insubstantial in my mind. Half crazed with grief and at Herr Bookman's remorseful request, I returned to Rotterdam, to the chapel of St. Anthony where Vanderhausen had first seen Rose. It was after evening vespers. And I was travel-worn and soul-weary. When the worshippers left, I remained alone in the church. And I must have fallen asleep. I was awakened by a soft touch on my shoulder. And awakened to see... Rose. Rose. Shh. I want you to forget me, Godfrey. And know that I am by the hand, a lamp in her hand, down a flight of steps into the vaults below. The music faded, and there was only the sound of our footsteps echoing on the stone. Where are you taking me? To where I have found rest. And was a bedroom, richly furnished. Its main feature, a great four-poster bed, the curtains drawn. 
She crossed to them, smiling, and said, You see, we are united at last, my husband and I. Sitting bolt upright on the bed, held in its position by the pillows, was Meinir Vanderhausen. The costume I recognized, the face, what was left of it, was still livid as I had first seen it. But by now the bones showed through the decayed flesh. The hands were little more than the claws of a skeleton. Exhausted as I was, overcome by emotion, the room suddenly swayed, and I lost consciousness. I was found the following morning by the sexton. The room in which I lay was the same, except that all the furnishings were gone, save one. In the place of the four-poster bed was nothing but a large and ornate coffin. I rubbed the dust from the nameplate, which read, My near Winkle Vanderhausen, 1606. To 1669. The man had been dead long before Rose Velderkaust or myself were born. Her uncle and I allowed her to marry herself to a corpse. sad and terrifying story, not calculated to make sleep any easier tonight, and yet a fascinating and absorbing one, as all of us are drawn irresistibly to the macabre. Besides, of course, it wasn't true, or was it? To Godfrey Shalkin's dying day, it was for him, so who is to say that it couldn't have happened? Not I. As I said in the beginning, you make your own judgment. I'll be back shortly. Schalken became a kind of living corpse who lived only through his paintings. But in spite of his success, he was recluse enough to insist on mixing his own pigments which, alas, were not stable enough to stand the wear of time. So only the one canvas I mentioned remains. They say because he used his own blood to dilute the pigment. I don't know. There's no proof. It's just a part of the legend. Our cast included Don Scardino, Roberta Maxwell, Guy Sorrell, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Marvelous how you can get around when you've got no body, isn't it? See him? Little white dog, curly tail. Oh, silly little thing. And see that big blue station wagon? It's going to hit him. No! I've got him. Got him, Cynthia. I've saved him. He'll probably get run over anyhow one of these days. No, he won't. No, he won't. I'm going to keep my eye on him. What about all the others? Them too. And cats and people and everybody. Oh, Cynthia. Why did it take me so long to find out what I was born to do? I could have spent my whole life doing this. Cynthia, my afterlife is going to be a hundred times more exciting than my life ever was. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy.